Now, the big talking point from the Bahrain Grand Prix, of course, was the heartbreaking near miss for Charles Leclerc at Ferrari. Looked like he was on course in just his second start for the team to take a commanding and thoroughly deserved victory. Great performance all weekend, and it should have been capped with him standing on the top step of the podium. But it all went wrong in the closing stages, an engine problem. And that's why I've got Jake Boxleg and Stuart Codling here to talk about what happened and what we learned about Leclerc making the step up to Ferrari and how well he settled in at the front of the field and where the Mercedes and Ferrari battle is after two races now, two very different races. But Jake, we've got to start with the technical problems. It's rare that we get a view like this, I must say, under the skin of a Ferrari, but we won't have you pointing at parts of this and explaining that's the bit that went wrong because it will be somewhere under the skin where the real problems were. In the end, we found out that it was effectively a a drop cylinder would yeah. be kind of old school speak. Now, we have normally hear about really high tech problems with these new F1 power units. I say new, they've been around since 2014. This is a bit more of an old school problem, though, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. We all thought it was originally during the race an MGUH failure and Q uproar from people who think that the engine, the t- uh, power unit is too complicated. But yeah, as you say, it was a proper old school failure. And so essentially what happened was his engine developed a misfire. And at that point, um, there's an inconsistency with the spark pattern, or it's just not igniting at all. And the engine sort of moves in a certain in a certain order. And once you lose one cylinder, you're down to five uh, in this V6 arrangement. On the face of it, you sort of think, okay, well, he's lost a sixth of his power, but there's more of a knock-on effect to that as well, because the turbo is not working as it should be. Uh, all of the other cylinders are having to sort of compromise, and Ferrari will be changing a few things on the pit wall to try and... Uh, try and work that out and work around it. But Ferrari are down on power, down on turbo, and they're starting to use a little bit more fuel as well. There's also the possibility of damage further down the line as that unburnt fuel gets expelled through the exhaust. Yeah, so that those are a lot of, if we were checking boxes normally for engine performance and, and fuel efficiency and all of that, those are a lot of crosses that we've just put through Leclerc's engine in the later stage of the race, which would explain why he was so vulnerable to attack from those behind. You briefly mentioned there, JBL, Ferrari would have been trying to make changes on the pit wall or Charles would have been doing it in the car to try and cover up for the problem. Like you say, you can't, you can't really recover the lost power, but you can maybe mitigate the damage. What sort of things would they have been doing engine mapping wise or what could be possible if you're changing your engine settings to try and reduce the, the effect it has on your performance? Well, obviously we're not privy to what options Ferrari have available, but we can obviously speculate. Yeah. And usually you're able to change the amount of fuel that's injected into each cylinder and so they'll probably be able to dial that missing cylinder back if they're not able to shut it off entirely. Put more fuel through the other cylinders, try and essentially eke out a little bit more power. But again, uh, you're changing the air-fuel mixture. Uh, it's not a, it won't be at a sort of optimal level and you're changing the engine efficiency. Um, all of these engines now, they're bordering on over 50% efficiency, which is the amount of energy they get out of that fuel. Obviously, they wanted Leclerc to go faster than he was. They were trying everything they could on the pit wall to try and change the engine mapping, change on how power was harvested, that kind of thing. They wanted him to try and target for 138 lap times, and he was only able to manage 140s, 141s by, by the time he dropped the cylinder. So those are sort of some of the ways that they could have tried to do it. But again, he's losing so much power that, yeah, it was just essentially damage limitation, really. Yeah, he was a sitting duck by that point. And perhaps crucially... Ferrari have referred to it as a component failure and they're pretty confident their plan at the moment is to run that engine on the Friday in China. So it doesn't look like a, at this stage a fundamental engine problem that means that internal combustion engine is, is out of commission already after just two races. But Codders, let's move away from the tech and get on to the man holding the steering wheel, Charles Leclerc. A fantastic drive and this wasn't an example of a guy coming in at Ferrari being number two and just sort of having one of those races where everybody else is out of your way and you just end up driving around at the front. He was in command all weekend, really, wasn't he? This, was a, this would have been a thoroughly deserved victory. Yeah, and he had to fight for that victory because obviously he lost the P1 at the start. What was in, really fascinating for me was to watch the inboard from Vettel and to see he got wheel spin as well. So both the Ferraris had wheel spin away from the line. Vettel was maybe faster at feathering it and so he hooked up better. But really, uh, it looked like Leclerc had blown it at the, at the first corner and then he really did come back and it was a spectacular it, performance. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's, that's the key thing, isn't it? We, 
we all wonder, whenever a guy gets plucked from a midfield team or from the back of the grid, these days, Formula One doesn't wait for you, does it? It's not like you can say, right, just have a season, kind of being Vettel's wingman, and then we'll see what happens after that. You've only got to look at the pressure that will already be mounting on Pierre Gasly to show that at the front of the grid, the fight is so intense that you've got to deliver immediately. And all suggestions from this weekend would be that Leclerc is now at that level. Yeah, I'd, I'd sort of noted in my little notebook uh, that maybe Leclerc hadn't done his tyre prep proper, properly uh, on the warm-up lap or something like that. And so I made copious notes. And then, of course, he went steaming past everyone a few laps later. <laughs> so it's like, start again. Uh, and you know, obviously, you know, he got that tyre temperature back. He got into his stride. For, for just a minute, he did look like someone who had cracked a little bit under pressure. But really, it was his teammate that did that later. He drove brilliantly uh, all the way to the end. And we've ended up with two very different race weekends to start the F1 season, haven't we? There was all the talk of Ferrari being ahead after testing and then a disastrous Australian weekend where they were just miles off the pace. Mercedes, I think, couldn't believe how dominant they were. What you might call perhaps normality was restored in Bahrain, but it basically means we've had a 50-50 split of who's been ahead so far out of Mercedes and Ferrari over the two weekends. I'm going to put you both on the spot. And at this point, Jake... Who out of Ferrari and Mercedes do you think is really ahead? Uh, I think it is strange because you sort of have to look at the merits of each circuit. In Australia, Mercedes obviously had the upper hand. In Bahrain, a more traditional race circuit, it was Ferrari had a huge advantage in the practice sessions. In qualifying, it was down to about 0.2, 0.3 of a second, but that's still, in today's terms, a big old buffer. Uh, in China, with Ferrari's purported engine advantage at least you would expect that to be the case again um yeah it's it's hard to say at this particular i don't want to nail my colors to the wall to be honest with you but uh i think you just have them <laughs> i think yeah, no fence sitting around <laughs> <laughs> um i think i'm gonna say ferrari then in that case um i'm sure i'll get slated for that at some point during the season but yeah i'll say ferrari for now does does feel like they've found something or they, they've been able to access something that was there but they weren't able to access for whatever reason during the Melbourne re weekend because they were so strong and there were some moments when you had a Mercedes running behind a Ferrari on the main straight with its DRS open and it still, even at the end of the straight, couldn't pass, which to me seemed extraordinary. So something is going on somewhere. We might see different things come into effect at different tracks China is front limited, so we might see the, the different chassis characteristics come into play as well as performance. But you can't really look past those huge straights in China, which, w when you consider that the main overtaking spot in that, that circuit is right at the end of a straight, uh, I, I don't see how Ferrari can be really challenged there. 